Once again, thanks everybody for joining us this morning. My name is Travis Dillard. I'm the president and CEO of Inflow Communications. And on with me this morning, we have uh, someone a bit new. Usually it's Chris Mitchell, our, our COO. Uh, this morning we have Jonah Sanford, who is one of uh, probably our top um, network contact center and unified communications engineers, probably one of the top in the country. And he uh, reigns uh, from our Dallas office and um, because Chris is on a plane this morning. so. But um, Jonah has many, many years in the, uh, the UC space, specifically as it pertains to the, the wonderful trials and tribulations of session initiation protocol. So uh, next slide here, Jonah. Quick introduction again. Um, I've been doing this for over 20 years since I was doing combat comm in the military. I've seen it all from frame relay to time division multiplex to IP to, to where we're at today in the market. <clears throat> um, Jonah has been also working um, in the uh, implementation, design, engineering, supporting for um, voice uh, and Shortel, specifically in contact centers for over 20 years. So um, this is our career. This is, this is all we do. Uh, so you've got a, a pretty good breadth of knowledge on the phone here today. Next slide. So the agenda, we're going to give you a quick few slides on who we are, who is Inflow Communications. Um, we have a lot of, uh, of new faces, uh, virtual faces on the call this morning, so I want to give you a quick update on who we are. And then we're going to jump into Shortel and specifically Shortel as it pertains to SIP. This was a, one of the more popular topics. We, uh, we've, we've, Inflow has been implementing SIP for, geez, it seems like about a decade now. Um, back when we were bringing SIP in and converting it to PRI and doing some other things to get around some of the shortcomings that Shortel had with SIP for many, many years. We're probably getting a lot of head nods right now. Um, it's definitely come a long way in the last few years. Um, so we, we were very intimate, very familiar with SIP. We've integrated with a number of different providers, a number of different scenarios. Um, uh, so it's there's a lot to talk about with this subject. And then we're going to give you a Shortel Connect update. For those of you that don't know what Connect is, it's basically Shortel's big release. Um, some people call it a complete code rewrite. Others, others say it's just a major upgrade, but it is major. Uh, different, different UI, different everything. And so, people on this call really have Shortel and are wondering if and when they should upgrade. Well, right now you can't upgrade because Shortel won't let you. But our goal really is to get you as educated as possible when it is time. We're on. We are on. Shortel Connect, and we've been on it for a while now, and there, there's a lot of trials and tribulations with that as well. So by the time, our goal is by the time people are ready to migrate to SIP, they understand everybody's going into it with both eyes wide open, um, and our goal is to educate you along the way. So in addition to these educational webinars and updating people monthly, we're going to be standing up a, a web page that's dedicated to all things Connect, and that's not the marketing side of all things connect it's really what to expect and what to consider and not only the the good bad and the ugly but things you need to consider when when upgrading like training and, and things like that as you implement them in your organization so and then we'll get into questions and answers so next slide again for those of you that don't know who we are uh, inflow communications um, we are a uh, very rapidly growing company. We ran out of Portland, Oregon. And we're the top privately held fastest growing companies in Oregon. Um, but we're also, um, we, we, we do business all across the country. We have offices all across the West Coast, Portland, Seattle, um, NorCal, Southern California, out to Texas, which again, we're Jonah's out of our Dallas office in, in Florida. But m really, we focus on uh, we provide national coverage to the right type of customer. We provide short tail implementation and support really to customers all over the country. Um, we are uh, very heavily anchored in the short tail platform. It's what we do. We're very focused on it. We're not. We don't dilute our focus. We do a lot in the contact center space. Um, we are uh, short tail's contact center partner of the year. We're their top three um, circle of excellence winner this last year. Uh, we're one of the few short tail platinum partners in the world. Uh, you get that with satisfaction, education, depth of experience, training, um, and the reason the reason we are able to do these things is because we are very focused. A lot of our competitors try and do a lot of different things and be a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and and we're very focused in the short tail UC and contact center space, solely focused, 
and it, which is great. And then we added the fact that all of the engineering talent we bring on from a PM perspective, project management perspective, to our engineers, um, to our help desk, we only bring on networking and sysadmin people because these are all, all applications on your network. So we make sure that we speak your language when it comes to the, the IT networking um, and sysadmin space. Next slide, Jonah. Some of you are on this call today. Thank you for joining us. Um, again, we support you know customers. We have about 77,000 short tail endpoints that we support nationally, actually globally. And um, so, and, and, and on the next slide, you'll see the reason we, we we're very focused on the type of customer we partner with. We have a core customer profile, which generally is more enterprise, um, has a, at least a north of 100 seats has mission critical communications and really values the service and partnership that, that Inflow provides. And so we're not like a lot of com uh, companies that try and just focus on going and, and winning all the business in a particular market. We, we're very picky and we focus on strategic partnerships with our customers really on a national or global scale. Next slide. Last slide on Inflow, our X factor. Um, we're very maniacal about these things. We're very, we're very maniacal about response, response, and response. So the speed, how fast do we respond, how fast do we uh, resolve, and how, how, uh, how much urgency do we communicate with. Um, so we take these things and we couple those statistics uh, along with our, our, our uh, answer times, along with our customer satisfaction in real time and put them on our website. So if you go to our website, go under support, live metrics, we, we, the whole world can see. Um, it's a big part of our culture. We want everybody to know how quickly we respond, um, resolve, and how, um, how, how well we communicate and how happy our customers are. So we're really focused on that white glove premium service offering. Um, we take it a step further. The compensation of, of our staff, upwards of 10%, is all tied to these metrics. So not only do we make these exposed to the world, but our, our people are paid this way. Um, and we also tie that to um, what we call our 8x guarantee. So we guarantee you that we'll be eight times faster to respond than the industry average or us will issue a $100 Amazon gift card. Or if we ever fall short of world-class customer service, if you look at the email signatures of any of our employees, um, everybody um, has the authority to issue that because we take it very seriously. So we put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and we can do this again because we focus on the right type of customer. I don't, I'm not going to be focusing on a 10-seat customer that's bogging my support team down and neglecting you who who has, you know, 3,000 endpoints and contact center. And so we can do this because we're very focused on our craft. We're very focused on the type of customer uh, that we partner with. And we're very maniacal about customer service and speed. So that's inflow. I think I think we just covered the inflow the inflow slide. Obviously, if you have any other questions, please email us. Let us know. We'd love to chat with you. Next slide there, Jonah. So I'm going to hand it over to Jonah. Um, Jonah is the one that's uh, been heavily involved with a lot of the SIP rollouts. He's been heavily involved with the, the Connect rollouts that we've done, um, the, the Greenfield Connect rollouts, and um, he was heavily involved with our own Connect and SIP integration. So he's he's got many, many years in this space. So um, feel free to ask questions. We'll pause as we go along, and we'll try and get your questions answered. Um, and before I do go on, just as a reminder, go to our YouTube channel. Just search for Inflow Communications, and you'll see all the videos we've been – we do these every month. We do uh, short tail administration training as well as, as well as specific contact center education and we chop these up into mini videos and we put them uh, free up on our on our YouTube channel um, so there's a lot of really good stuff up there about how to um, you know change an auto attendant greeting anything from simple to complex we've broken them up into little videos and be looking out for June or July we're rolling out our knowledge portal which will have actual tech articles all of the videos um, it'll have all of the uh, the white papers that we've written we're Education is a, is a big, big piece of what we do. So go check out our YouTube channel. Be looking for our knowledge base portal. In the meantime, you can go to our education page on our website, and you will also see more videos and more tech articles, white papers, et cetera. So um, we're constantly, constantly putting new educational content on our website. So that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Jonah. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Travis. Um, as Travis said, I've been involved in the UC industry uh, in one form or fashion for a little over 20 years. Um, 
was involved with SIP and, and ITG and, and whatever else Nortel called it back when uh, they were first rolling it out. So seen quite a, a good bit of it as we're calling it the good, bad, and the ugly of, uh, of SIP trunking. Um, so with that said, we'll get started. Uh, we're we're going to start with the good. Uh, SIP has a lot of benefits. Um, your, your first benefit we're going to look at here is flexibility. Uh, so um, SIP gives me more flexibility in PRI, uh, especially with DID numbers. Um, it, it's much easier to have market-based DIDs. Uh, you know, say you only have an actual presence in the Seattle market, but you have customers in Atlanta, Georgia, or you know, Dallas, Texas. You can have DIDs for those locations, and you can also outpulse caller ID for those locations to, to give your customer a, a more personalized feel. Um, it's also easier with SIP to retain uh, existing DID numbers that you own uh, whenever you add new services or report to a new provider. Um, you mentioned your caller ID and, and the fact that it's not location specific as far as you're not tied down to where you have physical equipment like you are with most PRIs. Uh, the second key benefit for, for SIP is disaster recovery. Uh, SIP gives me a lot of flexibility w with creating my disaster recovery plan. Uh, it, it enables me to do geographic redundancy for my inbound and outbound trunking. Uh, as you can see in the, the image here, if I have more than one location, I can bring in SIP trunks uh, to two or three of my sites. Uh, if I have a failure, then we can you can set up automatic failover to where you know say your primary site's down, but your other sites are still up. We have a secondary endpoint for your SIP trunking, um, and it will just automatically redirect. Uh, you also typically have, uh, depending on the pr provider, a, a very, very easy to use web portal for uh, you know forwarding numbers, forwarding DIDs in the case of an outage, uh, or, or changing where numbers are out. And just to elaborate on that disaster recovery, I mean again. SIP providers are not created equal, and so we can get SIP providers. Some SIP providers allow you to deliver trunking over um, either obviously dedicated connections. Some allow you to put it over, say, internet connections, IP, which we don't generally recommend in a production environment, but it could make sense for um, a disaster recovery solution if you wanted to bring in alternative connections in and fail, fail dial tone over to different transport mediums. Right, exactly. Thank you, Travis. Um, so, so the next thing that we're going to discuss is, is scalability. Um, SIP gives me the ability to buy trunks or add trunks on a one or two trunk basis versus with PRI, um, you, you either have to buy a full PRI or buy a partial PRI. Um, and it's a lot quicker to add sessions depending on uh, some carriers even have uh, flexible limits, if you will, to where you can set it up. You know, I normally have 10 voice pass or 10 SIP trunks, but we can on demand ramp it up to say 15. Um, you know, d d d as long as you're set up correctly for it. And that, that, again, that's not something every carrier has, but a lot of them do now. Uh, and, and finally, you got call savings. Uh, it's just typically SIP is uh, less expensive than PRI for your base service, um, even when you factor in if you have to have a dedicated circuit. It's still usually cheaper. Um, you also have you know, typically much better long distance rates, if not you know unlimited long distance rates, depending on the provider. So now we're going to move on to the bad. And when I say the bad, these aren't necessarily you know awful. These are things that we have to consider. Um, they're, they're not pluses, but they're not huge minuses for SIP either. Uh, and, and the first one of those that we really need to look at is the use of a session border controller. Uh, a session border controller, uh, for, the, for those of you who are new to SIP, acts somewhat like a firewall and somewhat like a translator. So it, it sits between your IP-enabled PBX and your SIP provider. Um, and it does a couple of things. Like I said, number one, it acts as a firewall. But number two, and, and most importantly, it does translations um, because not all SIP is created equally, and not all SIP providers are created equally, as Travis said. Uh, so there may be some things, uh, as you know, based on the way that Shortail does a transfer or a conference or a hold or, or something of that nature, 
may be slightly different than the way the, the SIP provider is looking for it. So that's where the session border controller comes in. It does those translations um, and, and keeps things flowing. Um, but you know, the downside to it is it's an additional point that you have to troubleshoot, uh, additional points that you have to consider if you're having issues. Uh, you also have to, depending on the session border controller model that you're using, take licensing into consideration. Um, and session border controllers are not created equally either. <laughs> there's there's right. ones that are we like to work with and there's the ones that we run from. So not not getting into specific manufacturers, but there there's definitely good and bad with that that side of it as well. Right. So the the second bad, if you will, is, is codecs. Um, and again for, for those of you who are new to SIP, what codecs are are compression rates. Uh, so how much your, your voice packets uh, get compressed to save bandwidth uh, and, and not all codecs are, are created equal. This is one where bigger is not necessarily better either. Um, G711 and G729 are the industry standard codecs. Um, there are some that are considered lossless, no compression that actually to, to most people's opinion, don't sound as good as either G711 or 729, which have some compression. Uh, and, and not every carrier supports every codec. Um, some of them support 711 and 729, but that's something that you have to consider and discuss with your SIP provider before implementation to make sure that, that we're using the same codecs that, that they support. Because uh, things that can happen if you have incorrect codec settings um, or codec mismatches is you can have no speech path, you can have one-way speech path, drop calls, or just failure to establish calls at all. Um, and the, 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 your bandwidth is also a consideration. Um, 729 is a good bit more compressed than 711. It still has good sound quality. Um, 711 is, I want to say about 30% compressed. So if you're looking 30, 40K per call usually, depending on what type of overhead you have. Um, but it's still something you have to consider. Um, so the next thing, and Travis has already touched on this a little bit, um, so your internet or your networking, you have to be very cognizant of, of what type of service you're using for your SIP trunks to be delivered. Um, of course, in a perfect world, our preference is to have you know, a dedicated uh, network connection, MPLS, something that has uh, guaranteed QoS in the end and has uh, actual enforceable SLAs to where you know you're going to get the bandwidth that you're paying for, you know you're going to get QoS in the end so that we don't have things like you know, jitter, uh, call drops, choppy voice. Um, those, those are all things that, that are, have to be taken into consideration. You also have to consider your, your firewall and your network setup um, because this is an, an IP technology you have to consider you know, making sure that you have the right ports open. If you have firewalls internally uh, for, for sending things across your WAN, um, those all have to be considered. Uh, the next one, and actually a pretty big one, is 911 calling. Uh, depending on the carrier that you're using and depending on your, your PBX, 911 can get a bit tricky with SIP. Um, one thing that Shortel does well uh, is it has a, a base functionality E911 service built in to where you can specify ahead of time uh, what your, your IP address ranges for each one of your sites are. Uh, and then the short tail system is going to look and say, hey, this, this phone's in the IP address for the headquarters site, so that means I need to send out the caller ID for, for the headquarters location to the PSAF if somebody dials 911 and, you know, on down the line based on whatever other sites you have. Um, but some some areas you may have to put in a full E911 solution. Those can get a little tricky. Those can get a little costly. Costly. So you, you need to take that into consideration. Uh, and then the final point on this slide uh, is your equipment and licensing. Um, so right now there's there's 12 different options from Shortel of devices that can house SIP trunks. Uh, you also have to, to take into effect into account licensing for those um, because whether you're doing short tail has both physical and virtual uh, but either either path requires a license. Hey Joan I'm going to jump in here there's a couple questions before we go on okay. to the next slide. 
Um, I could probably answer this one, um, and I'll let you elaborate. Um, have you seen issues with SIP providers not allowing remote DIDs to pass outbound? They call that alien TNs. Shortall passes out caller ID of user accounts, but when the user account sends a DID that is not part of the local trunk group, the call is rejected. So um, I think this, from what I've seen, and maybe I'm not answering this question right, you can elaborate. We've had times where, well, Shortall does great with find me, follow me, and other features. So if the Shortall system is forwarding the call back out and say it's passing somebody's cell phone number, so it's not a part of the DID block that you're, you're procuring from the carrier, the call gets rejected. And yes, I've, and I've seen this happen. Some carriers allow it, no problem. Some will make you purchase a specific feature upgrade. I think Windstream calls it their enterprise, and this changes monthly, but their enterprise pack or their enterprise feature. But basically, you, that is absolutely something you need to consider when you're, you know, when, you're, when you're switching to any provider. Make sure that when I'm sending out a caller ID or I'm sending out um, a caller ID that doesn't match my trunk group, um, I need to make sure that the call is not going to get dropped. So I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that, Jonah. I don't know if I answered that right. Uh, yeah, so that's a, a very good answer. Um, so it is something that's different carrier to carrier. Uh, there's also some regulations regarding it that each carrier is going to – different carriers interpret those regulations differently. One of them is the uh, Truth and Caller ID Act that was passed a few years ago. Um, so that's a discussion you need to have with your carrier if you're planning on sending out numbers um, outside of your, your DIDs for your specific area. The most common restriction that we see is, is them saying you have to send out a DID that, uh, you know, that you're purchasing from them. It may be a DID that you're purchasing for a different location, but um, that, that's the most frequent restriction. Um, a lot of them, like, like Travis said, if you purchase a service, will allow you to outpulse any number you want as long as it's not something fraudulent. And the, the follow-on question to that was, in a global deployment that uses LCR, least cost routing, on a global scale, this can be a huge issue. So yeah, if you're, if you're, um, if it, if a user is places and wants to make an outbound call into say a different country or maybe a different state, we would lose dial, we'd route the call across a wide area network and out dial tone resources in that state, sending the local caller ID of um, that particular user. And if that carrier doesn't recognize that particular DID, it, it drops same sort of scenario right so again the, the answer is it de it depends by on the carrier it also depends on the specific situation that you're what you're trying to to accomplish so we've had some situations where you can mask different outbound caller IDs based on it, at the S session border controller level there's things that you can do but um, we might want to chat with you a little bit more about that um, exactly what you're what, what the carriers are saying to you and and what the particular when you say is it global is it through countries is it across the United States we have to dig into it a little bit more um, other questions um, I currently have a short tail with a PRI connectivity um, should I be able to find out from my provider how heavily the PRI is being used so I can estimate my SIP needs can short tail give me that information I think I can answer that too trunk the uh, there is some reporting and some metrics um, within short tail that allows you to see generally how what the the uh, the trunk utilizations are on a PRI um, yes your I would think your carrier should be able to give you that but I've seen carriers not be able to provide that information depends on the carrier so um, but I don't know maybe you can dig into ways they can see what their simultaneous call requirements are All right. so and depending on what release short tail system you have uh, if it's 14, then uh, you have the diagnostic and monitoring tool, and part of the dashboard of that will show you trunk group utilization uh, for one days. Uh, I think the, the settings are one day, seven days, and 30 days. Uh, so you can you know, get a, a chart at a glance if you have 14 too. And also, I think if there's some tools with with the diagnostics and monitoring tool that can give you a kind of a quick snapshot of what that looks like. Right. Let's see, other questions here. Um, is Inflow's preferred session border controller device N-Gate? I could answer that. Absolutely not. Let's see. <laughs> um, another question. It would be great to have a list of which carriers would allow this. This particular carrier does not, um, who is what they're currently using. This is, Paul, I'm assuming you're referring to the um, list carriers that allow or don't disallow foreign outbound caller ID 
and yet yeah, we could chat about that a little offline but yeah it's it's a uh, it's very carrier specific and I don't think we have a list I think we have tribal knowledge because we work with every single carrier every single day so that might be something we could chat about um, and, and help you out with that so. let's see yep that's it that's it that's where we're at so far so we can uh, move on. I, I did see one of the question Travis uh, someone was asking about uh, using SIP without an SBC oh yep thank you um, so it is possible it's not something that we would typically recommend. Um, I mean, we've done it before, uh, and I'm sure we'll do it many times again. Uh, but it, unless there's reasons not to, uh, you know, one of the reasons might be cost considerations. Um, we typically recommend having a session border controller because it does provide you a lot of benefits. Um, it gives you more control over how you're. Uh, allowing the, the, the provider to access your network. It also gives you more control over how you're doing things as far as translations. If you know, Today they may work fine natively without an SBC, but the next time they update their, their code on their, PB, on, the, on their carrier PBX, it may break things. I'm sure any, any of you that have been involved in the PRI world and remember years and years ago, um, you know, it wasn't very uncommon for, for Bell or you know, whoever your carrier was to do an upgrade on, on the central office and all of a sudden your caller ID is broke or you can't make international calls or you know things like that and the session border controller gives you more control over uh, resolving those type of issues. Okay, uh, if that's it then I guess we'll move on to the ugly. Let's see. So, sorry, we had one more slide for the bad. Yep. Um, the, the the other thing to consider with SIP on, especially on Shortel, is what Shortel calls uh, SIP media proxies. So, as Travis was mentioning earlier, when Shortel originally rolled out SIP trunking, there were a lot of features that uh, didn't have full parity with PRI service offerings. Or product offerings, things like uh, music on hold, recording calls, monitoring calls, uh, the way you had to do conferencing of calls, um, those were all either not available or had very limited functionality on SIP trunking. So Shortel um, came out with a, a device called a SIP Media Proxy that allows that full feature parity with with PRI. Um, as you can see from the slides, there's there's certain Call scenarios that involve a media proxy, um, music on hold to to callers on SIP, recording calls, monitoring of calls, conferencing calls. So those are some of the prime examples. Um, but with this, you have to consider uh, number one, what type of short tail device you're going to use for your SIP. Uh, if you're going to use a physical device, then we have to look at what type of uh, support those have for for media proxy. Uh, as you can see. Um, the newer ST devices, which are part of Connect, uh, typically have more capacity for uh, SIP media proxy than the older short gear switches. Uh, and you'll also notice that the, the virtual trunk switch has full capacity. So if it does 500 trunks, it does also it, it does 500 proxy ports. So that's something that you, you have to take into consideration. Um, you know, there, there's if you're if you're using SIP and you you have say 12 SIP media proxies, but you have 24 SIP port SIP trunks, that doesn't mean that the 13th call is going to you know, not complete. What that means is the 13th call, if the first 12 are using something that requires a SIP media proxy, such as music on hold or recording, uh, that 13th is only going to get the the base SIP functionality, and they're not going to have the availability until one of those other SIP media proxies frees up. So. And this Depending is on your the, call scenario. Go ahead. I was going to say this is one of the biggest gotchas that we see all the time. Um, oftentimes, even other the other short tail partners forget to calculate the media proxy capacity. They're not asking you what you're using, what sort of media proxy requirements you would need. And this is a this is a big one. This can halt a SIP project in its tracks or wreak havoc once the SIP project's in. So sorry, just adding a little flavor. Pay attention to this slide for sure. 
Okay, so that brings us to the ugly. Um, and, and as we said, SIP has a, a lot of benefits, it has a lot of flexibility, it has a lot of features, but there are some things that it's not good at. Um, there, there are some things that you really have to consider. Uh, and, and the first one is failure scenarios. This has gotten better than it used to be, but it's something that we're still um, still working on and we still have to consider. So there are some fails, some failure scenarios to where calls can't complete, but the, the short tail system or whatever PBX that, that you have, it's not just a short tail problem, it still sees the, the SIP trunks as up and idle, so it's not going to do any of its automatic failover routing. This is really based on the nature of how SIP works, um, especially um, when you have one or more session border controllers in the middle. Uh, even if you don't have a session border controller and you're using uh, you know, native provider uh, without, it, without a session border controller, they still have one. Whenever they deliver SIP to, to your location, they're going to put a box on site. You know, similar to how with the PRI they put a CSU DSU device, well they, they're going to put a router slash session border controller device. So with most PBXs, if I can still ping that device or if I can still ping my session border controller, the system thinks that it's up. Um, so therefore it may or may not do its automatic failover if it can't complete calls. Something that we have to consider, there are some things that are, that are in progress, there are some different ways that we've looked at, you know, doing notifications, uh, like with the short tail, if you try to make a call and it, and it fails, you can get some notifications in the event log, so we can do like event filters based off of that. There, there's several options, it's just something you have to consider. Um, the second one is the configuration and setup. So, as we've said several times, not all carriers are created equally. Uh, there, there's some carriers out there that, that I've done implementations for that I know we're going to have a basic phone call to establish the parameters, you know, how many digits, what we're looking for, caller ID, and then the turn up's going to be, you know, a five minute non-event. There's some carriers that it takes a day or two of, of trial and error testing to get our translations right to where my calls will complete, I can make outbound calls, inbound calls, transfers, holds, all of that. Um, the, the reason for that, and also kind of the reason f that we always recommend a session border controller, if you ever look at the, the traces of an actual SIP call, whereas a PRI, you know, on the detailed messaging, you get a basic, you know, message that says ringing and then it establishes. Well, the SIP version of that, it's a packet that has a header and it has a body and it has a URI map in it, um, and it does things like uh, forwards and refers. The 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 industry or the the SIP standard for those is a little still. So the way carrier A does a forward or refer, which would be a transfer or hold or, or a music or a conference, any of those functionalities may be slightly different than carrier B. So that's where you may or may not have to do some trial and error to get things working correctly. Um, again, we've done work with a lot of different providers. Uh, a lot of them, there are actually app notes on Shortail's website that can you know, give us guidance and get us really close uh, to where we might only have to tweak one or two things. But it's something you have to keep in mind and you have to build in a little bit of extra time in your uh, implementation timeline just in case you have issues. And the third one and probably the, the one that causes us the most pain anyhow is uh, faxing. Faxing by its general nature is, is data being transmitted via audio tones. So when you start getting into compressions um, and multiple compressions and, and or, or that audio being compressed and decompressed multiple times across multiple devices, we can get up to 15 and 20 percent failure rate sometimes. Um, the industry as a whole developed the T38 codec to try to help combat this to make faxing more successful over SIP. The problem is not all fax machines and not all carriers support T38 yet. Um, it's not brand new, but it's still new enough to where it's not 100% supported yet. Uh, and the, the, and the other thing with that is not all short tail switches, a lot of the, the old full width switches don't support T38 either. 
Um, and I think that's probably a good point to stop for questions well, again. Well, one, yeah, uh, well, there are some questions. And one thing to jump into on T38, you know, so T38 is basically a handshaking protocol that was developed kind of like TCP to allow faxing to work better. Um, the, you know, the, the problem with T38, I think, maybe you mentioned this, it's, it's about a 5% failure rate. So that's generally unacceptable for a lot of people that are still doing a lot of heavy faxing. So just keep that in mind. T38, if it is supported, isn't always the end all. And some, some carriers will also want to uncompress, they'll, they'll uncompress fax calls to G711. But it gets really complicated with SIP because perhaps the end device that's receiving the fax um, isn't compatible, or there's a, a leg in the network of the carriers that's not that's implementing or, or not implementing the proper T38 handshake or, or really the, the compression end to end. So, what we've learned is instead of trying to fight that battle, if you still if you if you if you just want a fax, generally time division multiplex or analog is the best way to go, or a fax server solution. Um, then and that's more of an opinion for me, but we just we've you know it's a lot of pain and agony that can come around. SIP and for heavy fax usage. I don't know. Did I did I say that right, Joan? I want to make sure I'm not saying anything technically. Yeah, in definitely. Okay. Uh, questions. Let's see. So um, let's see. Looks looks to me like session border controllers are a weak link in the chain. Um, can session border controllers be configured in a high availability fashion? I'll let you take that one. Probably depends. Definitely depends on the session border controller. Yeah, exactly. It depends on the session board controller, um, the make and the model. Uh, there are some out there that can be uh, set up as an HA device. Uh, some can't. So I don't want to you know, get into recommending one session board controller over another one right now, but that's that's something to consider, something to look at. And session board controllers uh, can be appliance-based or virtual as well. Right. Um, and then another question here. You keep mentioning to add to implementation plan for certain considerations. What typical implementation time to bring new SIP trunk service into Shortel? That's that could be a an hour long conversation. I'll let you I'll let you take a stab at that. <laughs> yeah. So there there's several things to consider with SIP. Number one is if you're moving from say you have AT and T right now and you're moving to a level three, for example, or or something of that nature, and you're you're bringing your DIDs with you, the first consideration timeline-wise is how long they're going to require for uh, a service turn up uh, from your provider and how long they're going to require for a report date. Depending on the carrier, that can be anywhere from, I've, I've seen 30 days and I've seen you know them ask for four to six months, depending on if they have to bring in physical facilities uh, to enable SIP or not. Um, once we have good dates from your carrier, we can typically implement it reasonably quickly with you, um, just based on you know taking into consideration your call flow needs. If you need anything changed, if we need to develop anything, it's hard to give you an exact number. But you know, say if a carrier gives you a 30-day turnaround, that's typically plenty of time for for your uh, partner inflows to to design and, and program and set up your SIP trunks uh, from the short tail side. Usually the slowest part is the you know getting the, the, the trunks and the DID porting set up from the carrier. I know that's not a specific hard and fast answer but well I think testing kind of, I think you touched on this a little bit but testing is going to be really important too giving yourself enough time to test make sure that things work yes. correctly. Yes, and and typically you have a whenever the the trunks are delivered from the the provider, you typically have a basic test. Then, uh, if your if your PBX isn't ready for SIP trunking, um, but typically what we try to do is have the the PBX built and, and ready to go for the SIP trunk. So as soon as the uh, provider uh, engineer or service technician is on site to turn up there into the SIP trunks, we're ready to go to test. A day or two before we're scheduled to, to cut over, so we can, you know, the nice thing about short tail is I can build those trunk groups and not give anybody access to them, and we can test inbound calls, outbound calls. Um, you test inbound typically by the the provider will give you a temporary DID uh, that's just for testing to assign to those trunks. So you can, you know, you can have a DID to test inbound calls. We can test outbound calls, transfer, hold, all the features and functionality. Uh, we typically like to ask for two or three days from 
you know, from the date that the, the service is delivered to where we can do all the testing and if we need to make changes or get a hold of the, the carrier to have them make a change, it gives us enough time to do so. Next question, I heard that Shortel now has a virtual SBC. Hmm. Not, not that I'm aware of. I know they have a virtual SIP switch, but um, and you can leverage different session border controllers that are virtualized, right? Right, John. Am I answering right. correctly? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Shortel themselves, that I know of, they don't provide any session border controllers themselves. Uh, for for many years, they partnered exclusively with Engate, and Engate uh, fairly recently launched a virtual session board controller, but Shortel also now supports several other models uh, besides just Engate. That's probably what you're getting is the Engate partnership there, Mike. Okay, I don't see any more questions. We could probably move on. Great questions, though. Keep them coming. Okay, so that's the the end of our section on the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we're going to now move into a basic admin course on how to set up uh, a new SIP trunk trunk group uh, and, and everything that goes into that, uh, as well as the site and system considerations that you need to look at before you build your SIP trunk group. So the, the first thing that we need to look at, and I mentioned it uh, in, in some of your considerations, is your codec list. So uh, the first step before you start building the SIP trunks or the trunk group is to go in and make sure that you have proper codec list built in the system. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, you manage those from, from Shortail Director, from the call control, and then go to codec list. Uh, and the ones that we, we recommend are the PCMU slash 8000, which is uh, it's just another name for G711. Uh, then also add the, uh, the G729. So name those, whatever you want, save them. We typically recommend uh, a step more on the codec list. We typically recommend for all of our customers to have a two different codec lists, one with G711 first, one with G729 first for intra and inter-site calling. If you have bandwidth considerations, if you don't, if, if you have a you know one gig pipe everywhere or 100 meg pipe everywhere, then we typically recommend 711 as first choice, regardless. Uh, so once our codec lists are, are built then you need to go to the site and, and keep in mind that any site that's going to be making SIP calls or receiving SIP calls, um, you, you need to do this for each one. So of course you're going to start with your headquarters site. Uh, so we, we open the site from the director, go down and specify uh, where I've, under, under the bandwidth section, number one is going to be intra-site, number two is going to be inter-site. Um, the, the third one is the facts and, and modem calls, the, the codecs that you specified for those. Uh, the other thing that you'll want to consider here is, is make sure that you have the value defined for mission control bandwidth and make sure that that's high enough. Because what the Shortel system is going to do, if that's set to zero or if, say it's just set to, to 10K, then you're probably only, only going to be able to get one or two calls uh, to, to go out of that site. And, and, either a SIP trunk or a site-to-site -site basis because what Shortel does with that is it says, okay, this is how much bandwidth I have available to make calls in and out of this site, and if I exceed that, then block calls. Don't allow any more new calls to, to be established. So once those are set up for all of your sites, uh, then we're going to go uh, and, and look at a SIP trunk uh, device or SIP trunk switch, if you will, to, to house your SIP trunking. Uh, and again, this can be either a virtual uh, trunk uh, using VMware, or it can be a physical trunk. And uh, the list was of all the different switches was a little bit earlier. Um, the, the things that you'll want to make sure that you check on that once you build the switch itself is uh, to, to specify how many trunks you want uh, to, that switch to support, and also how many uh, media proxies you want it to support. And those are done with either the drop downs or with the, uh, the built-in capacity fields. There are a couple of the switches, such as the T1K and the 220T1, that instead of doing the drop downs, there's a checkbox that says enable um, 20 or 
like for the T1K, it's it's it says enable 20 SIP trunks with media proxy. You just check that one box and hit save, and it takes care of all of it for you. Uh, so once we have that set up, we're going to go and we're going to do our uh, SIP profiles. Um, the SIP profiles handle some of the uh, feature, uh, like the forward and refer capabilities of the system. Um, it's the base level before you get into the session border controller. And typically there's an app note, uh, or you can get the information from the provider if there's not already an app note on the Shortel site. Uh, for, for your specific provider that tells you which SIP profiles that we need to enable. Uh, there's some that come pre-built in the system. Um, matter of fact, the list that you see right there is the list that comes pre-built in the Shortel system. Um, if we need to create a new one, then uh, you would go into the SIP profiles from director, name it, um, specify the actual parameters that you want. Um, and again, we would usually get that information from an app note or from the provider themselves, uh, and then save that, that list. Uh, so now we've got the, the preliminary setup uh, completed, and we're going to build the actual SIP trunk route, uh, or the SIP trunk group, should I say. So from director, we're going to go to trunks, and then trunk groups, we're going to specify the site that's going to house the physical equipment for those SIP trunks or the virtual equipment, should I say, the, uh, then select that we want a SIP trunk and say go. Uh, oh, and I, I did skip. So for our examples, our examples here, this was a uh, screen capture of a level three uh, SIP trunk and trunk group that we built for, for our customer. So, um, most of these, if you've built any type of PRI trunking before, most of the fields in this are going to be pretty familiar to you. Uh, the key differences you'll notice will be the uh, the drop down for the profile. That's where you were going to select that profile that we built earlier, or if we're using one of the ones that was pre-canned in the short tail system. Uh, you're also going to, from here, specify the number of digits that you're expecting to see coming in from your CO. Uh, with most SIP providers, that's 10, which uh, you know most PRI trunking, uh, you're either going to be three or four or five digit, you know, matching whatever your extension list is or your extension length is. But with with most SIP providers, they uh, they outpulse ten digits by default, unless you ask for that to be different. Uh, and then we're going to go through a lot of the same setup as you would for a PRI, as far as if you if you want to have DNS, if you want to have DIDs, we would enable those just like you would for a PRI. Um, the, the other thing that you typically always want to enable for SIP trunking is the tandem, allows tandem trunking field. Um, that way if you have calls that are coming into site A and then need to go to site B or transfer back out, it's allowed. Uh, so the next place we're going to go is down, you know, we'll scroll down the page and we'll go to the outbound section. Uh, from there we're going to specify things. Uh, the first thing of course is the access code. Uh, and then your local area code. Uh, if you have additional area codes, we would uh, specify those here. You, of course, want to put your billing telephone number in. That's that's always key to, to put that data here and on the site as well. Because if you have a phone that's that doesn't have a DID specified or a caller ID specified in its programming or a user, this is where the Shortel system is going to grab the uh, the data to, to import or to input for their caller ID if, you know, if the user itself doesn't have one. Uh, then you'll you know you're, you'll also want to select the services that you want to allow for this trunk group, uh, local, long distance, international, etc. Um, so then once that's all selected, we'll scroll down. Uh, then we'll get to the trunk digit manipulation field. So this is one thing, and as you'll see here with, with level three, they support what's called E164 dialing, uh, which is similar to a cell phone. Uh, you know, with your cell phone. You can call a local long distance number. You don't have to put in a one, uh, or if you put in a one and it's not really long distance, it'll still route the call. A lot of SIP providers will support that if you if you request it. Um, L3 or level three does it by default. So if that's the case, it, it makes your job a lot easier because now we don't have to do things like uh, you know, local prefix list or specify what's local, what's long distance. Um, It'll just it'll support it either way. It, it takes the full 11 digits on the outbound side. 
So if possible, that's what we definitely recommend. Uh, if not, then of course, just like with a PRI, you'll need to specify if you have a local prefix list or not. Um, and if you do have one, then, then select it in the drop-down menu there. Uh, then we'll go back to the top and click Save. It's a pretty simple process. Uh, from there, the, the next step is we've got to build our trunks. Um, just like uh, analog trunking, this is a very easy, easy process to do. So uh, we'll, we'll go to your back to director, to the trunks, then individual trunks. Uh, we'll select the site. Uh, in this scenario, we see it's headquarters. We select the trunk group that we just built. It's for us is here is level three. We click go, uh, and really all you have to populate here is the name of the trunks, the switch, whether it's physical or virtual, that's going to support those trunks, the, the IP address, and this IP address that we're entering here is going to be the destination that we're going to talk to. Typically, that's going to be the internal destination of the session border controller. Um, then we specify the number of trunks that we need uh, and click Save. And that's it. Your trunks are built. Um, past that, then you're going to get into you know, the basic setup uh, and, and or customization of your session board controller. Uh, and being that there are several different models of those and they all program a little bit differently, that's not something we're really going to get into on this one. But I will tell you for all of the session border controllers that Shortel supports, they have app notes on their support site uh, that you know, we could either provide for you or if you have a lot yourself that take you through the basic setup um, for the session border controllers. So uh, that, that brings us to another natural stopping point for questions. Okay, so let's see. Um... Uh, we need to elaborate a little bit on what he means, what you meant by tandem trunking, and how to and how the user groups affect it. Okay, good question. So tandem trunking uh, gives me the ability to route calls if if I have an inbound call that comes in on my SIP trunk, uh, and I want to do a transfer back out. Uh, that that gives me that availability, and what the trunk group or or what the um, class service your user group setting does is it it puts the restrictions uh, on, on what type of calls can be routed um, back out so it, it's going to think of it just like if a user was going to be making the call what what do we want to allow to happen so if you only want tandem scenarios to work for local calls or if you want them to work just for for long distance those are all going to be set um, by the, the user group that you set for tandem trunking uh, for whatever the, the call permissions are in that user group. I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yep, and uh, another question, I think this is, sorry Mike, I think you asked this twice and we, we accidentally skipped over it. Um, can you use older 40 slash 8, 60 slash 12? So basically the, the vintage older model of short gear switches with SIP if you're not concerned about media proxy. I actually don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I will find out for you shortly. Mike, we'll get an answer for you. We know how to get a hold of you. Make myself a note on that real quick. Okay, let's see, any other questions? <clears throat> yeah, um, does Shortail give you any heartburn, any support heartburn if a customer is using an SPC other than Shortail? So you probably mean one that Shortail is not integrated with. Well, in my experience, I've seen Shortail look for reasons <laughs> to, to give you support heartburn. So my my cynical answer would be yes, but Johnny, you spend the most time with, with the Shortail tag, so I'd... So let you take that one. Uh, I personally don't have a, a lot of experience working with TAC on uh, session board controllers that aren't supported by Shortel because they now support, let's see, one, two, three, four, like six or so, um, and, and those are the most common ones that we come across. Uh, the, the two primary ones that we come across are Adtran and Engate. Um, 
but yeah, I'm, I'm sure if you're using one that's not supported and it comes down to a, an issue of something not working correctly on, on a scenario that involves a session board controller, that might be a, a, an area that Shortel says, hey, that this, you know, you're not going to support a session board controller. Let's see. Um, let's see if there's any other one. Um, okay, I think uh, I think that's it for now. We can probably press on here. Okay. Um, so that's. So now we're on to the uh, the Connect update. So, as Travis said, Connect is Shortel's next big release. Um, it's still in controlled release right now. The, uh, the the beta trial for it began in April of 2015. The the controlled release started in October of last year. Um, we're currently running the ninth controlled release build. Um, as the slide says, there's been a lot of progress uh, as far as becoming more stable and in it having all the features and, and functionality that we're used to with Shortel, it's just it's not there yet. Um, right now, uh, there's still uh, Shortel has 17 medium to, to major uh, documented known issues with the latest control release build for the uh, the core PBX software, uh, and then the the client has 150 major to medium defects still published, um, and Additionally, the, the Connect client and the whole look and feel of Connect is, is an entirely different experience for not just you as an administrator, but the, even more so really for your, your end users. Um, so that's, that screen capture that you see there is the Shortel Connect client, which replaces uh, Communicator. So as you can see, it, it's an entirely different look, an entirely different interface. Um, most of the functionality is still there, it's just the way that you do it is going to be different. So um, here's another you know, screen capture of some of the other screens in the, uh, the Connect client. Uh, and, you know, Connect does have a lot of really nice features to it and, and some additions. Um, the, the, the new design, it really updates the, the look and feel of, of the communicator client. Um, it, it's a lot more what people are looking for and what they're used to with a, with a UC platform. Um, it has uh, one-click uh, conferencing and desktop sharing from the client, uh, you know, so you can very easily, if you're on the, on the phone with someone, um, someone else on your system, there's a, a, a button right there by their picture that you can just click and do a, a, a quick desktop share. Um, it has LinkedIn integration. It has uh, Outlook click to dial from your contacts. It has a few new call handling modes, and then there's a few other new, new features as well. But we're going to recommend that uh, once Shortel announces it and, and goes to, to GA status with Connect, we're going to recommend all of our customers wait six months uh, just to make sure that all the major medium defects are, are worked out. Um, because, uh, you know, as everybody knows, when, when you're coming out with something that's really new, it doesn't matter how well you test it. There, there's always going to be a few bugs that you don't see until you go you know, to, to full release and it gets fully out there in the field because you just you can't test every call scenario um, the way that you know, a, a person with a contact center or a person with a, you know, a bunch of auto tenants or a bunch of you know, unique routing, you may have scenarios that, that just are, are different than, than what the, the, beta trust, the beta test sites and the control release sites have, have tested and worked with. So we are, uh, as Travis mentioned, we're, we're, we're going to be doing a complete webinar on Connect uh, in the next 60 days. We're also going to be launching a, a website that's pretty much all the ins and outs of Connect, um, what you need to, to think about before you deploy it or you consider deploying it, uh, any gotchas that are still around, um, training issues. Uh, training is, is, is a key thing that you need to consider before you go to Connect because the, the, the user interface is entirely different. So if your users are right now using Communicator, they're going to have to get trained on how to use the, the new Connect client. Um, and you're going to have a, an adoption time frame to where you know, things that aren't really issues may get reported as issues if, if you don't spend the time to train those, those end users.
So um, that kind of brings us to the end of that section. So I guess we'll open it up for uh, more questions. Let's see here. Um, so the, the first one I see on Connect is the uh, does the Connect client still have the ability to dock top, bottom, side of the screen? Uh, as of now, no, it does not. Uh, the last roadmap I saw said that's coming, but it's part of the control release. Some of the features, uh, especially some of the, uh, the, the client side features aren't available yet and won't be available until we get a little bit closer to, to, to the GA build. Next, um, Kay, Craig, I saw your email. Let's take that offline. I think the question being, can we get a test bed for administrators to try out the new client? I think you'd basically have to build us, from what I understand, you'd have to build us a, a separate lab with Connect, a completely separate system. Yes. You're not going to be able to take the Connect client and really do anything with it, with your current deployment, Craig. So let's we can we can chat through that. Um, what version of Shortel do you need to be on for Connect? Well, that's the thing. It's actually I think what we're 14.2. It is some people call it Connect version one, or some people call it, uh, 15. Basically, it's basically the next iteration. Right. right. I mean, so there will not be a short tail release 15.1 or 15.2. It's 14.2, and then Connect is the next uh, feature release of, of short tail. It's, it's taking the place of what would have been short tail 15. And right as of now, correct me if I'm, again, correct me if I'm wrong, because you've been up to your eyeballs in this. There really isn't a an upgrade path for customers that are say on 14.2. It's it's basically a rebuild of the system, which obviously that's not going to be that's not going to work. But I haven't heard anything official on. Um, what that upgrade quote unquote methodology is going to look like of you, Jonah? All right, so right now there is not a supported upgrade methodology. I mean, we have tested that you know you can update, do you know do an install slash upgrade and get the database and you know your base information on the PBX to upgrade that works. There's some quirks or some problems with it still. Uh, that's part of what's yet to be worked out in the control release process. There is no upgrade path right now for the client side. Right now, it's uh, you have to go manually uninstall the Shortel Communicator client and then do an install of the Connect client. Um, so it's it's just there's not a supported upgrade path yet. That's something that they're they've yet to to publish and and will be part of the GA build. Next question: How do you train if you don't have it installed? Um, yeah, training. That's 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 the interesting one. I mean, we haven't obviously nobody's upgraded from Shortel 14.2, let's say to Connect. The Connect rollouts we've done have been Greenfield Connect rollouts. Um, so there's definitely a lot of thought around how the how can how the training is going to work for your end users. I don't know if you want to comment on how you'd approach that from an how we will be approaching that from an implementation standpoint. Uh, it, it's going to a lot depend on the, the customer and what they have av available to them. Uh, if, it, if it's a customer that has a virtual environment already, then we, you know, and they have space available on their virtual host, we would probably leverage that to spin up a, a test slash training uh, virtual environment uh, for for use uh, for the uh, cust for their end users. Um, you know, worst case scenario, we can go through uh, you know like videos and and screen captures and you know. That's not optimum, but uh, you know, absolute worst case scenario. That, that's kind of what we're we're looking at doing. Uh, typically, when we do one as a new install, uh, and will probably be the same case if we're doing, uh, you know, if we're managing and doing the, the upgrade, is we'll use like a demo slash training kit that we have. It's it, it's very similar to a, a, you know the, the demo kit that some of you have seen Shortel do demonstrations with. It's just one that we've built up specifically for training. It has you know more users built in it, more phones, that type of stuff. Um, yeah. it's, it's really going to depend on what you have available. I mean, that's one thing we try to work with our, our customers on and, and customize the best training plan for you we can because training is, is crucial. It makes your life uh, much, much easier if, if all of your end users know what to expect and uh, are comfortable with the product before you roll it out. And we have professional trainers, and we will be um, rolling out specific customized training packages when the time comes. Um, we, it's just right now we don't know what the upgrade path is going to look like, and but yeah, training is going to be a big piece of it. So I would definitely say keep keep an eye on our website, be looking for the uh, 
the connect page it's going to be up and we'll make it pretty front and center and we're going to have all of these questions or ideas outline a issues things to consider um, and then what inflows gearing up and doing about it to make sure that it's as smooth as possible for our customers oh, let's see another question here will connect include an API to leverage other conference systems I don't think we have an answer for that one yet Jonah no they, they haven't really re released a whole lot uh, on the API side yet <laughs> here's a here's an interesting question slippery slope here how well does connect integrate with contact center so it's I'll let you I'll let you take that one Jonah because it is it is connect contact center it actually the the contact center piece goes along with it on the up on the upgrade so as it stands right now that's a uh, the the contact center piece is now called interaction manager the, the part that the agent uses it's a web-based application um, so in, instead of where you currently use either the agent toolbar or you have the agent toolbar integrated into your uh, communicator client uh, on connect contact center you will use the the web page based agent manager um, so it's really not integrated in the traditional sense of what you're used to seeing it's it's a different it's a different user experience it's uh, I mean a lot of it, the, the web page looks the same as the client it has the same buttons it has the same feel and you know you operate it the same way but it's it's web based uh, and the, the reasoning for that that I've gotten from my contacts and the people I've been working with is uh, a lot of contact center administrators were asking for the the ability to uh, you know quickly roll this out to, to different platforms and not be reliant on a piece of software that has to get installed on the agent's PC, especially when you're doing things you know like thin clients for for agents and, and virtual machines. And I know right now, a lot of the back end tools are are going to be similar for the contact center piece. Right. But yeah, that's stay tuned on that one too. That's obviously that's one we're keeping our eye on very closely. Um, I have someone working remotely and in the office back and forth, so do I have to carry separate user configurations on cloud and on-prem, or does Connect use a single configuration database across both? So this would probably be for Shortel's hybrid world, where you're, you have an on-premise system, perhaps for your corporate office, and then you have remote offices that are in the cloud, I think? Okay, hybrid, yeah. He, he's clarifying it's a hybrid implementation so maybe you can you can take that one I would I would I'd say they work remotely and when you say remotely I'm assuming you're saying remotely they are working from the uh, from their home office or if it's a remote office so maybe you can talk a little bit about hybrid and where that's at right now and some of the limitations so with with a home office uh, you're, you're typically not going to use you've got options but but typically what I would recommend if it's just a home office and it's one person um, would be to leverage the uh, on connect anyhow would be to leverage the edge gateway uh, which is going to allow you to just put a, a phone and a uh, you know, on their on their location you don't have to have a VPN concentrator so to speak the edge gateway handles that it's also what handles your uh, connect client uh, communication so that they don't have to be VPN to end like a, as you know now if you got someone working from home that's using a laptop and they want to use either soft phone or their communicator client for, for uh, instant messaging or, or conferencing or what, what have you they have to you know, be VPN in your network the, the edge gateway takes care of that functionality um, as far as the hybrid uh, you probably want to take that one offline it's, we don't have a lot of quickly available information on that it's still very much in flux um, I can give kind of high level on what hybrid version 1.0 is and and um, Philip I don't know if this is if you have hybrid in place or if you're look you'd be looking at going hybrid but I know right now the it's basically it's taking your premises space system and doing a, a SIP tie into the cloud system so there's four digit dialing um, there's shared directories I don't think things like presence necessarily works in that that world so like like Jonah said yet I'm saying yet they have to start somewhere but um, I think I think the idea is eventually all of those features would be in, in, integrated between the cloud and the and the, and the pre premises based system but I think initially you would probably have that one user that would work probably off the edge gateway they would either be on one platform or the other as opposed to right. spanning both and then and there's a solution for that 
Yeah, based on your last comment there, Philip, and like I said, we, we can take it more offline to, to get in depth, but it sounds like what they're talking about when, when they're pointing you to connect is leveraging the edge gateway because that's one piece of uh, it's typically virtualized uh, that, that allows me to do a single sign-on and you know my phones uh, can register to it, my contact center agents can, can use it to register, my connect clients can use it to register, everybody. You know, it, it's one flow versus with now if you've got work from home agents, the, the PC has to be VPN and the phones you have to use a VPN concentrator and you know it, it makes that a lot more seamless. So, so that's yeah, most likely what they're referring to. Let's take it offline. We can chat about it. So it could be connect hybrid could be a, a solution for that. Um, mm -hmm. We just want to make sure that you're getting the real answer, the answer that's that's going to make the most sense for you guys. So Shortel is definitely motivated to sell cloud seats. So I just want to make sure that you're getting getting the right answer there. Good questions. Um, I I don't see any questions yet or any other questions. Um, so we have some follow up with a, a few people. Um, See if there's anything else coming in. So th thank you very much, everybody. I really, really appreciate you joining. This is a reminder. Go go look at our YouTube channel. Um, be looking out for the the Connect web page. We're going to be rolling out in the next couple of weeks. Um, look at our. Um, be looking out for our knowledge portal. You know, we're all about educating. Um, so be looking out for those things. Be looking out for our invites. We do this every month. Um, and we pick different topics. So if you go on our homepage, click register for webinars, you'll see the all the different webinars that we have coming up. I think we're scheduled out right now through August. Um, and we are going to be sliding in a very special out of sequence uh, training session specifically for Connect because it is it is a moving target right now. So um, appreciate your your time and and um, we will hopefully be talking to some of you immediately and. Others will be talking um, in a month when we do our next administration training. So thanks from Inflow. Have a great day.